James Bond. We both eradicate people to make the world a better place. I just want to be a little tidier. Come on, Bond. Where the hell are you? 007 fans have been waiting since last April to see the 25th James Bond film. The release of No Time to Die keeps being delayed because of COVID and the cinema closures. It's due out next April, but it seems likely that it'll be pushed back again. Not to fret, though, as we have a brilliant new spy book to recommend for you. And one of the main characters is called Ian Lemming. No link whatsoever with the creator of... James Bond, has it, Stephen Clark? Exactly. For legal reasons, it's not Ian Fleming, it is Ian Lemming. It's not at all like the creator of James Bond, I must say, in case there are any lawyers listening. Well, the book is called um, The Spy Who Inspired Me. And just to remind um, people at home, Stephen Clark is a best-selling British author who lives here in Paris. You probably know him for his novels about France, such as A Year in the Merde and Merde Happens, or his books aimed at helping us understand this country... Uh, like Talk to the Snail and A Thousand Years of Annoying the French, or The French Revolution and What Went Wrong. Now, um, The Spy Who Inspired Me is mostly set here in France, but it's slightly different to your other books. Mm. Um, where did the inspiration come from? Uh, the inspiration came from two things, really. First of all, I've always been a, a Bond fan, really, you know, like everybody, but I, I really like the early books. But the only trouble with the early James Bond books, the first ones, which were written in the 1950s, is that Bond is a kind of upper-class snob. He's like racist, sexist, he's everythingist, you know, except feminist. And, you know, and that's always, it's always made me think that, you know, these days he'd never get published. And I, I'm quite fascinated by the creator of James Bond, Ian Fleming, who kind of usually used to hint that he himself was the inspiration. Whereas when you look at his actual war career, he spent most of his war in a comfortable office in the Admiralty doing nothing very active at all. And, and so it came from that. But also, at the same time, you can read about these female spies, uh, real female spies in World War II, who were a lot more active than Ian Fleming, and who, in fact, are a lot tougher than James Bond. Because so could you like, describe this as a Me Too take on <laughs> James Bond, would you say? It's kind of that, because what it is, is it's a female agent, a real young female agent, who would, in a Bond film, be the Bond girl, sort of the glamorous woman, you know. But in fact, she turns the tables on the creator, the supposed creator, you know, on Ian Lemming, this naval officer, who gets stranded with her in occupied France. She's on a mission, and he's saying, I want to go home. I've got no clean clothes. I haven't got enough cigarettes. You know, where's the champagne? And she's saying, it's not about that. You know, it's about hiding in barns, desperately hiding your identity. Because, you know, in the Bond films, he goes around saying, the name's Bond, James Bond was you couldn't do that in real occupied France. You had to do everything you could to hide your identity. So in my book, the, the young female spy, Margot Lind, she goes around in London before the mission trying desperately to buy secondhand French underwear because she needs to be totally French when she goes into France. You know, you can't go around with your Marks and Spencers labels. You had to hide everything. So it's about the reality of being a, a female spy in World War II France. Well, I recently actually discovered a French spy who basically saved Paris's art from the Nazis. Um, you might know about Rose Valland. Kate Blanchett played a character inspired by her in Monuments Men. She was a remarkable woman, as Selena Sykes reports. In occupied Paris, a silent war is waged to save France's artwork. On one side, Hitler's right hand man, Hermann Goering, and against him, Rose Valland a discreet woman with a fierce determination. In 1940, French museums were emptied shortly before the occupation. The Nazis looted national and private artwork, mainly from Jewish families. The Jeux de Paume Museum in the French capital was used as a depot for the storage and sorting of the stolen artwork before distribution to Germany. Rose Vallon, a museum employee, started secretly recording information about as many of the works as possible including their titles, owners and destination. 
Elle va prendre des notes. Elle va she took euh, notes on a big risk because she kept the notes with her. Elle. Elle prend sa she went home on her bike chez elle. Et and in the evening she made a copy of everything she noted down. Bien, euh, ces she called off a feat de, de, by de memorizing the stolen artworks. La mémoire des œuvres volées. France was liberated in 1944. Rose Vallon became a captain in the French army and left for Germany on a mission to find the stolen artwork. Out of 100,000, 60,000 were recovered, largely thanks to the notes she took. On the ground, Vallon was extremely determined, verging on being obsessive. Rose Vallon bothered France's foreign affairs department. She annoyed diplomats. She had an uncontrollable side. She was repatriated to France a bit earlier than planned. She would have stayed in Germany, but France wanted to turn the page on the matter. Vallon fell out of the limelight after her return. She died in 1980. Over the last decade, her story has regained prominence. In 2014, Kate Blanchett played a character inspired by her in the film Monuments Men. 75 years on, Vallon's research still provides precious information for historians. A rose Vallon helped repatriate something like 60,000 pieces of art after the war. Stephen Clark, do you think we're hearing more women's war stories than we ever were before? Yeah, we were for a long time. They were kind of hidden, you know, and um, no one talked about them very much. Um, I f found one spy who particularly inspired me when I was writing The Spy Who Inspired Me, um, a woman called Noor Inayat Khan, a woman of uh, Indian origin who was in London training as a spy. She was about she was 26 years old. Um, and all her trainers were saying a bit like Melissa McCarthy in the film Spy, you know, she's too small, she's unfit, she won't be any good, she won't resist um, interrogation. They sent her into France as a radio operator, which was the most dangerous thing you could do because the Nazis were pinpointing radio signals. And in, in my book, um, the Margot Lind, the spy, has to go into France because the radio network has broken down because the operators have been captured, you know. And this Noor Inet Khan, she went in, operated as a radio operator, really courageous, and was eventually betrayed by um, a French spy in a kind of jealousy love triangle, you know, very French story, you know. And poor woman was um, killed in Dachau. Very unromantic, un-James Bond-like story, you know, but they're quite inspiring and we are hearing more about them these days, yeah. And the Second World War is this period that um, British people talk about with pride. Um, mm. How do you think we're going to remember or be remembered for the time we're living now, the time that um, we left the yeah. European Union? Ah, but you mean Brexit? Yeah. How Bre well, it's. I think it's a bit sad, you know. Um, I wrote this book called A Thousand Years of Annoying the French, which basically is a kind of apology to the French from us, the Brits, for annoying them at every occasion over a thousand years. And during those thousand years, sometimes by accident, we always seem to win everything. And just before Brexit, we were really annoying the French because we had such a great deal from Europe. We had all these refunds and, uh, you know, um, we weren't in the euro. We, were, we had everything we could possibly want out of the EU. And the French were really annoyed about it. And then we gave it all up. You know, it's the case of taking a huge shotgun, pointing at your foot, everyone saying, don't pull the trigger. And you just pull the trigger and blow your foot off. That, I, that, I think that's how we'll be remembered. Now, Stephen, as well as I'm writing books, um, you spend a good amount of time explaining Britain to French people and France to non-French people. So I wanted to ask you about um, the reaction to the COVID vaccination here. Um, artists are rallying together to encourage people um, to have the vaccine, but there's been some reluctance about it. I'm going to ask your thoughts in a moment, but first, Alison Sargent reports. It's a simple message brought to you by an all-star cast. Jacques Weber, François Morel, Audrey Fleurot, Richard Berry. All together, 200 French artists signed a letter in Le Parisien newspaper saying they're ready to be vaccinated. Actor Lambert Wilson says they're hoping to set an example. We can do something about it, and everyone's scared of the vaccine. I'm a child of vaccination. If I'm still here today, it's thanks to vaccines. And I don't understand. Maybe it's generational. I don't understand why there's this distrust of vaccines. France's cultural sector has been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. A successful vaccination campaign would allow performers to get back to work. The only way we have right now to get rid of the virus is this vaccine, as soon as possible. It's the only way we can invite people back to the theatre, back to the cinema, back to other live performances. 
The reopening of performance venues will mean life has returned almost to normal. But for that to happen, there will need to be a shift in public opinion. As it stands, some 58 percent of people in France are against getting the vaccine. So in the UK, the general consensus is that the vaccine is a good idea, a solution. But here there is a lot of scepticism about it. Why do you think that is? I have no idea because the French are usually such a technological, scientific nation. You know, normally you'd think it'd be the Brits because we're kind of more punkish, hippie-ish. You'd expect the Brits to say, no, no, you know, fish and chips three times a day will kill the vaccine. You know, but in fact, it's the opposite. I have no idea why the French have gone down this route at all. Maybe it's just sort of um, being locked up all day. They've, they've gone completely insane. Now, we're nearly out of time. During this strange time of Brexit and COVID, are you writing a lot? What are you working on? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's sad in a way, but lockdown, if you're like me, um, sort of a writer who doesn't really do much else, <laughs> it, you just sit there all day, no meetings, no lunches, hardly any travel at all, and you just um, write. So, um, yeah, I've been writing a lot. But I'm, I'm looking forward uh, um, to the, re, the re eventual release of the James Bond film, because my novel was originally plan to come out for the release of the James Bond film. It didn't come out one time and then another time and we actually released the novel and now it's finally coming out. So I'm looking, that's what I'm aim, you know, looking forward to. You're looking forward to. Well, hopefully it'll be out in April, although yeah. it's not looking that certain. Your book is called The Spy Who Inspired Me. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen Clark. I remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up in France 24 after this. You don't know what this is. He's going to kill millions. If we don't do this, there will be nothing left to save. Views. France 24 brings you all the news from hotspots around the world. In France, Asia, the Middle East, the Americas, and Africa. From Europe to Oceania, take a daily trip across borders to keep abreast of all the latest international news. Get exclusive updates from our correspondents around the globe. Our daily reports will take you to all four corners of the world. Every day, watch World Views on France 24 and France24.com.